thank you everybody for joining us online. You'll be pleased to know that this is an online session because I am uh, suffering with a bit of a cold, so distance is key. Uh, just to make sure we're not spreading that. Um, so as mentioned, I am the project manager of sustainability and climate change. So my role is to determine actions uh, within the community that need to be taken um, e either at the municipal level, at the upper government level, or working with our community partners, whether they be NGOs, business owners, uh, conservation authorities, to ensure that our community can be, be um, climate responsible and also climate resilient. Um, to ensure that we can continue to function as, as a community. So today I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of climate change. So I'm going to go through some of the more technical pieces um, as we talk about climate science. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about the types of actions that can be taken to specific sectors in order to move forward. Um, so a little bit of uh, an overall climate change definition, um, and it is used fairly loosely as a term, the word climate change. Um, and I do need to emphasize it doesn't actually refer to the current weather. Climate change is actually a significant long term change in the expected patterns of an average weather of the whole earth over a significant period of time. So we're not looking over the weekly or the monthly weather patterns, we're looking over you know, many years, maybe even many centuries in terms of what that change in climate looks like. And then there's two terms that are kind of loosely used around the climate change discussion. The first is global warming. And global warming specifically denotes the mainly human caused increase in global temperatures. So this is mainly uh, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere causing our planet to warm. Whereas climate change looks at both the global warming, so that increase in temperature, but also discusses more specific um, attributes of climate change, perhaps that also be changes in precipitation or more severe storms or rising sea level. Climate change speaks to all of those different changes. So just use that as a word of caution when you're using the words global warming versus cl climate change. And for us, climate change has become um, a major area of our focus because of our uh, consumption of fossil fuels, specifically um, oil, gas, and coal. And you'll see here from the Prairie uh, Climate Center, there's a graph that shows that global temperature has been on the rise since around the year 1880, all the way up until today. So this graph only goes to 2017, but uh, trends show that we're continuing to increase. And the reason why 1880 is a significant time period for us to start looking at climate change is because that was when the Industrial Revolution occurred. So that was when we first started to consume fossil fuels and put greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So as we have that, that, that back cast, so we've seen what the, the climate change has done over the past couple of hundred years, we're able to use a lot of different models, um, and these are from the International Panel of Climate Change, to predict what the future is going to look like. And most of our future predictions go to the year 2100, so, you know, that's a, just towards the end of the century. And the way that um, we actually have been able to do these climate projections is based on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we have in our atmosphere. So what we have is a historical trend. So that's the black trend. And that correlates with what we saw in the previous slide of that past uh, climate change scenarios. But now we have a choice to make. We have the opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And if we did a significant reduction, we would actually be able to reduce the global temperature increase and follow the blue path, also known as the RCP 2.6 local global emission scenario. So temperatures would actually stay below that one degree temperature increase. If we continue to um, emit greenhouse gas emissions at the level which we are doing so today, we will continue on a path of the RCP uh, 8.5, which is the high global emission scenario. That is the red line. So that's if we continue on the greenhouse gas emission scenario today, we're going to see an average global temperature increase by around four degrees Celsius. And then there's RCP 4.5. And that's if we approximately reduce our emissions by around 80% by the uh, approximate year of around 2050. 
and that's the RCP 4.5 scenario. And we'd actually be able to keep that temperature increase below the two degrees Celsius. RCP 4.5 is significant to us because this is the um, projection model that was agreed upon during the, climate, uh, the Paris Climate Accord in 2016. So many nations agreed that in order to protect the world from climate change, we need to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions and keep below a global temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So just a little bit about greenhouse gases. So concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are increasing, and it is primarily as a result of us consuming fossil fuels. However, the main um, greenhouse gas emission is carbon dioxide, and perhaps the one that is discussed the most, but there is actually a five to six different greenhouse gas emissions that have an impact on climate change. There is also water, so steam, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. These different greenhouse gas emissions have the ability to act like a blanket around the, Earth's temp around the Earth's surface. So when the sun shines and its radiation pierces through the Earth's atmosphere, it becomes trapped under a blanket and as a result heats the planet. And that's where you get the term the greenhouse effect. So greenhouse gas emissions have the ability to trap the Earth's, the, the sun's temperature underneath the atmosphere of the planet and therefore cause the planet to to heat. And when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, first of all, per population, Canada has the highest emissions of greenhouse gas emission per person than anyone else in the world. And that's more than the United States. And a lot of people think, oh, that's because we have such cold winters. But unfortunately, that's not the case. The main reason for our greenhouse gas emissions in Canada, according to the government of Canada, is as a result of our oil and gas sector. So the extraction and manufacturing of oil and gas within our country actually results in a lot of greenhouse gas emissions being emitted into the atmosphere. Followed by that is our transportation sector. So we are a big country and we are very car dependent and most of our cars are, are um, fueled by fossil fuels such as gas and diesel. And as a result, our second highest source emission is the transportation sector. What people are often surprised at is actually how low our electricity is. And the greenhouse gas emissions in our electricity system does vary from place to place, depending on what generates it. So electricity in Ontario is fairly low in greenhouse gas emissions because we are primarily fueled by nuclear energy, which doesn't consume oil or gas. Whereas out west, where they're using oil plants to generate their electricity, their greenhouse gas emissions would be much higher. However, overall, our electricity system is not bad. Neither is our heavy industry. And a lot of the reason that our heavy industry is, is fairly clean is because it pays to be efficient and to reduce the electricity. However, our buildings, our residential buildings, do consume a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Many of us use natural gas or propane or oil to heat our homes all of which are fossil fuel derived um, fuels. So as a result, our buildings are the third highest uh, greenhouse gas emission source in Canada. Other emissions come from things like our agriculture sector. So everyone's heard about the farting cow. Uh, yes, cows do emit a lot of methane, but so do the equipment that is needed to operate to plow our fields, to plant our corn, um, and to, to run the operations of a farm. And we have a lot of agriculture here in Canada, and as a result, our greenhouse gas emissions from it are also fairly high. And then finally, there's our waste sector. So every time we throw something away, um, it does have a greenhouse gas emission associated with it, regardless of whether it is placed in landfill, in incinerator, or is recycled. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. So with all these greenhouse gas emissions being released into the atmosphere, what does that mean for us here in Ontario? Well, we have a number of climate uh, projections that are in place, and uh, they basically all show the same thing, that Ontario is going to get warmer, wetter, and wilder. Yet we are averaging, going to see an average of more hot degree days, so more days above 
30 degrees Celsius by the year 2050. Bearing in mind that we're only uh, 30 years away from that. 2030, we're gonna see an increase in 30 degree days during the summer months. And we're gonna see an increase in average annual pre precipitation, but with a decrease in summer. So what we're gonna see is more intense rainfall, maybe more intense snowfall, followed by patterns of dryness. And this uh, can be very difficult for us. And then we also anticipate seeing an extreme, uh, an increase in extreme weather events, such as heavy rainfall, ice storms, and wind storms. Now we all recall the tornadoes in Ottawa of last year, so we're anticipating seeing more frequent by the year 2050 across Ontario. So when we think about increased annual precipitation, what does that mean for us as a community? Well, here in Whitby, we are located right along the shorelines of Lake Ontario. So we've been dealing with extremely high lake levels causing flooding. When you have lots of damp areas, there's an increase in things like vector-borne diseases. So more ticks, uh, more risk of West Nile disease. We also have to apply more salt on our roads, which can have an impact to our trees. It may impact our ability to get outside and do things we like to do, like hiking because of flooding or erosion. And it could also damage our natural environment as a result of us having to clear things like snow from our driveways and pile it up against small areas. So annual precipitation is a major concern to us and perhaps one of the most costly climate change impacts that we have to deal with within our Ontario community, just because flooding is so expensive. When we start to deal with increased temperatures, there's a whole variety of impacts that we're dealing with as well. So when we get warmer temperatures, there is an increased risk of poor air quality. And that can have a severe impact on your health, on your ability to get around, it can damage products, and it can just make it not pleasant to be outside. When it's dry, um, it can reduce the ability for plants to get the water that they need and actually cause them to fall over if it's coupled with a heavy windstorm, if the soil is very dry. We've also seen trends such as the pine beetle following warm temperatures, so the spread of invasive species. Forest fires uh, are a major concern, and more importantly for southern Ontario's grassland fires as well, during those periods of drought, and of course the impact to our agricultural community. If we have long, dry, hot temp summer agriculture, there is also some suggestions that we may be able to actually increase our productivity as a result of the longer growing seasons caused by these warmer temperatures at the same time. So we may be passing a longer growing season for exposure to greater diseases to our crops. And then finally, there's severe storms. So in 2013, Southern Ontario experienced a major ice storm. Um, auto, last year in Ottawa, we saw major hurricanes come through and we are seeing more and more severe storms happen throughout our communities. And they can be incredibly disruptive. Not only can they damage things like our cars and our buildings, but they can cause um, widespread health effects. They have an incredible impact on people's mental health, especially if you are subject to losing property or receive, being damaged. Um, and it can stop you being able to move goods. So it can impact the economy. If the roads are all icy, for example, or flooded, or it's too windy to drive, um, and then it can damage us, our infrastructure, which can have an impact on your taxes as well. So severe storms are really something um, that are very challenging to deal with, but can impact us in very many different ways. When it comes to dealing with climate change and actually developing actions to flight, fight climate change, we actually break our actions into two different streams. They are climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. Now mitigation, aims to reduce, reduce the causes of climate change. Whereas adaptation involves modifying our decisions, activities and ways of thinking to adjust to a changing climate. So what I like to say is that mitigation really focuses on us reducing greenhouse gas emissions to prevent that long-term RCP 8.5, that severe global temperature increase Whereas adaptation is protecting us along the way. We know that we're gonna see some changes whether we like it or not, and we need to be ready to make sure that we are protected in, in the front of that. 
Now with adaptation and mitigation, there is something that, uh, some things that quite often overlap, particularly green infrastructure, trees, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, as well as water and energy conservation. So adaptation, keep this in mind, involves the modifying of our decisions and activities to protect us from a change in climate. Mitigation looks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to actually protect climate change from us. So the first sector I'm going to touch on today is energy buildings and transportation. So as you saw, these were the major energy sources that residents have an impact over within our communities here in Canada. And how we deal with energy buildings and transportation from a climate change perspective is broken down into those climate mitigation and those climate adaptation actions. Mitigation, energy buildings and transportation is the main contributor of climate change. We consume a lot of fossil fuels to deliver our energy for our buildings and our transportation system, particularly our fossil fueled vehicles, our oil and gas for heating and cooling our buildings, and the energy required to power equipment such as lights, phone chargers, maybe it's industrial equipment to run um, an elevator. Um, mitigation consumes a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas on adaptation side, energy buildings and transportation can be impacted by climate change. For example, if we have a severe weather event, there could be a power outage. There is a risk of incre uh, an increased risk of flooding as a result of changing precipitation. And there's a potential for increasing electricity consumption for air conditioners because we're dealing with warmer summers. Or we're going to have to replace or change the materials that we build our infrastructure out of because it's getting damaged by those climate change events. So this is an example of how energy buildings and transportation are impacted from a mitigation perspective and an adaptation perspective. Energy solutions for climate change are fairly broad and but are easily uh, applied. So from a mitigation perspective, a way to reduce our greenhouse gas So whether that be active transportation, walking or cycling, or switching to an electric vehicle, or using public transport. They are examples of mitigation actions that we can use for our transportation system. From an energy perspective, we can move away from things like oil and gas to heat our home and look at sources of clean energy. So geothermal, wind, solar, these are all examples of clean energy systems that we could use to heat our buildings. And another way to easily mitigate is actually to just reduce our energy uh, consumption. So finding ways to reduce the amount of energy we use within our buildings, within our transportation sectors, and within our, our, uh, our equipment that we use. So an energy efficient example for driving, for example, would be to conduct multiple trips to different areas uh, in one go versus going out lots of times. Or energy efficiency within your home is to switch out all your light bulbs from incandescent to LED or upgrading your hot water tank to a more efficient system. Those are examples of reducing energy consumption across the sectors. Now from an adaptation perspective, it's a little bit different. First and foremost, now we have to plan for disasters. So those severe events or potential risks of flooding, we need to know how we can continue during those, disasters, those disastrous events. So a disaster management and business continuity plan is critical. So if a road is closed down and I'm not able to get to school, what are my options and what do I do? Gonna flood, how do I protect myself? Perhaps I don't keep my sewer backflow valve to prevent flooding from coming into my house in the first place. So these are examples of adaptation methods I can do from an energy perspective within my own home or within my buildings. Now, as I mentioned, with mitigation and adaptation, sometimes there's a little bit of an overlap. And examples in the energy sector is water conservation, 
So water conservation not only saves energy and reduces greenhouse gas emissions because we don't have to clean it, but it also helps on adaptation perspective because during an emergency, access to clean water may be challenging. From a mitigation perspective, new energy systems can help reduce energy, but on an adaptation perspective, if there are new energy systems and they're efficient, they're likely going to be able to run during something like a power outage, or they have a long lasting battery or something like that. And there are so many different examples in which mitigation and adaptation actions can both help towards the energy solutions for climate change. Transportation being our second highest emission source within Canada is a major area of focus. And I do want to emphasize the hierarchy of sustainable transportation. Although we are very fortunate to have a solution of electric vehicles presented to us, it isn't the only way in which we can reduce energy consumption um, and mitigate climate change in this sector. There is a hierarchy of sustainable transportation and it's kind of like the reduce, reuse, recycle. These are your six rules of sustainable transportation. So if you are trying to opt out for a sustainable transportation method, my first option would be, can I walk? This is the greenest method of transportation available to us, walk or run. Followed by that is cycling, then public transportation, freight, electric vehicles, and then right at the bottom, the most least desirable, as an airplane. So just bear this in mind if we're talking about uh, sustainable transportation, that walking and cycling and active transportation is still far more greener than switching to electric vehicles. And when we talk about mitigation actions for buildings, there are so many things that we can do. We don't always have to build uh, brand new. We can upgrade to make sure that our roof have a light color. So lighter color roof shingles reflect the sunlight and therefore cool the areas around them and can slow down the urban heat island effect. If you insulate your attic properly, you can save up to 25% of your energy bills. So this is a great way to save energy is to make sure that your attic is well insulated. If you look at automatic light, lighting can save uh, up to 15% of your energy costs. So if you leave a room, the light automatically goes off if you're not very good at remembering to switch them off yourself. Using low flow showers and toilets can save a substantial amounts of water within your home and therefore reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One thing that people don't often know is that a programmable smart thermostat is a great way to save energy. So a Google Nest or an Ecobee um, knowing when you're going to be home or when you're away so it knows when to heat and cool an area can save a substantial amount of energy. As well as things like LEDs, um, programmable blinds, curtains, these are all small ways in which you can save energy around your home. And many of these specific items can be scaled up and applied to a commercial building or an industrial building. So if you've got a project in mind, um, consider these uh, energy saving opportunities around the, any type of building that you are designing. I also want to emphasize that if you are designing a new building, highly efficient buildings are now typically built to a net zero carbon or a passive house standard. Yep, that's right. We can now build a house that absorbs more greenhouse gas emissions than it actually emits into the atmosphere. And this is through good design like that shown in the image to the left. When we deal with adaptation for buildings, um, it's a little bit different. We want to think about things like renewable energy, uh, renewable and backup energy, um, an electric generator, for example, if there's a power outage. We really need to think about flood protection, so backup stormwater or sewage. We also want to think about durable materials. Are these materials that can get wet in the event of a flood? Are they materials that can handle the heat very well? We want to think about smart siting. Perhaps building a house in a floodplain isn't a great idea. Make sure that we're on top of a hill and that water isn't going to impact your home. We want to think about things like rainwater harvesting or like colored roofing to save energy, backup systems in general, there's also stormwater management. So installing things like rain gardens, 
or planting with uh, native plants and pollinator friendly species. These can all help your home become more um, a, a resilient to climate change. So the next section I want to talk about, and I believe this is the topic for the 2020 Environathon, is waste and climate change. So waste has a very uh, integrated impact on climate change and climate change mitigation and resilience. So when we think about the waste system, we've got to think about it on a life cycle basis. So first and foremost, when you extract a material from the ground, there is waste that is created. For example, if we are um, milling uh, wood for a, a, a wooden table, for example, when we take that tree down, we're not using all of those materials and there's instantly waste that's created from that sector. Then when we actually put it through um, the manufacturing side, we use energy and through that process there's waste uh, generated there. And then when the product finally gets transported to you, there's waste generated through the transportation system. You utilize your table for as many years as you possibly can. And then at the end of, the, of its lifetime, it's time to think of ways to dispose of it. There are really three major ways in which we can dispose of items within uh, Canada. We can send them for landfill, we can send them for incinerator, or we find a way to recycle and compost. And the, the ways in which we recycle and compost really depends on the product and the availability for sorting uh, within your local area. So as you can see, throughout those five stages of your life cycle, um, life cycle of a product, there is an opportunity for greenhouse gas emissions to be emitted into the atmosphere at some point in time. However, within that, with selective uh, product um, selection, we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So just keep in mind, there is the five stations of a life cycle uh, waste consideration. So there is the material extraction, the manufacturing, the distribution slash transportation, there's the use of the product, and then there's the end of life management. So when we're thinking about waste, we quite often only think about number five, but we actually need to think about one through five in order to ensure that we're making the best decisions possible around climate change. When it comes to disposing of our products, there really is three or four different ways in which we would prefer to recycle. First and foremost is let's try not to create waste at all and reuse the product if at all possible. Then we will look to recycle or compost. Then we look for energy recovery. And then finally, it would be landfill. And that would be the least preferred option for us available to us. Composting is also a very interesting subject matter for us. Composting has a really huge impact on the environment and it could be one of the biggest benefits to us if we utilized it a lot more. Composting decreases greenhouse gas emissions. When we put things like food waste or yard waste into our garbage, we are sending it away for a permanent disposal service like a waste to energy plant or a landfill. And as a result, they are the main reasons in which landfills and incinerators emit methane from into the atmosphere. Methane is a greenhouse gas emission it is four times more potent than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we really do need to, sorry, 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we really do need to find ways to reduce organic materials from going to permanent waste disposals, such as landfill. So using things like a pop can versus a plastic bottle, we can recycle at 95% less energy than making a new one from raw materials. That's a significant amount of um, greenhouse gas emission reduction, and it allows us to reuse a material and prevent new materials from being extracted from the environment. So recycling uses less energy. So as a result, fewer fossil fuels are burned, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, which decreases climate change and global warming. So when it comes to dealing with waste, there really is a hierarchy that we want to consider. And it's a little bit more complex these days than the original reduce, reuse, recycle. There really is six steps that we want to consider. There's rethink, which is consider what can be done differently to reduce our environmental impact. There is refuse, just say no to single use items such as plastic bags, straws and, and to go containers. 
And then we reduce. So when we consider a new purchase, ask yourself, do I really need this? Should I make decisions that decrease the amount of waste produced? Shop at local farmers markets and secondhand stores where you can produce items with little or no packaging. Buy in bulk and avoid single serve sizes. If reduce is not an option, then I want to think about reuse. Can a product be reused again? Can we find a different use for it? Reusable grocery bags, for example, and travel mugs. And if reuse isn't an option, can I repair it? When an item breaks down or no longer functions properly, can I fix it? When I'm considering that new item, can I take it apart? Can I put a new battery into that phone? Can I put a new heel on those shoes? How easy is it for me to repair my product so A, I only have to purchase it once, and B, I'm now reducing the amount of waste goes to landfill when only a small part of my item may not be functional. And then finally, recycle. Over the years, recycling really has been the default action to offset our environmental impact. But be cautious. Not all materials can be recycled through your household collection. And the best way to recycle is to be informed about what goes where by checking your local municipality or your waste collection contractor. It isn't a sound approach to consider the recycling symbol on the bottom of a product because just because that product can be recycled somewhere, it doesn't mean it can be recycled at home. So moving across some waste, I want to talk about forestry and climate change. Forestry is really unique and trees are really unique when it comes to dealing with our climate change um, situation. And this really is as a result of trees being able to not only help mitigate climate change, but they are also incredible at adapting and helping us become more resilient. So when we think about the carbon cycle, we think about trees within a carbon cycle, um, we know that plants absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they absorb carbon dioxide in order to grow. And as a result, they're actually able to remove greenhouse gas emissions from our atmosphere. So planting more trees is a really good thing. However, as they grow and get old, um, they do come to the end of their life and they start to decompose. And when they decompose and start to generate soil, they actually start to release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere again. But not the full amount, because whatever is left as that solid soil is actually still a carbon product. But what's interesting is we don't just allow trees to grow and die naturally in the forest. We use their materials a lot. We use biomass, for example, to generate energy and some renewable energy plants. And the great thing is this is a great way to use decomposing forest material and create energy, a clean source of energy. Another way is to use wood as a material for building things. If that wood continues to stand, it's still able to store carbon, something that a lot of our other materials that we have to us are not able to do. So wood and trees are really are an exciting climate change solution for us. From a mitigation perspective, um, trees can really do a good job at home as well. For example, we can plant trees to actually offset our heating and cooling costs. For example, we plant on the west and northwest, we are able to provide mid to late afternoon shade in most locations. Therefore, that would reduce our need for air conditioning. However, if we plant shade trees over patios and driveways and air conditioning units, they're less likely to come on and off over time. And then shade trees east and west, but we do need to prune them in the winter to prevent blocking the view and allowing some sun sight in the winter. So when it comes to climate message, emissions by absorbing carbon, trees can reduce energy consumption, wood products store carbon, and wood fuels are a renewable um, energy source. From an adaptation perspective, trees help cool surface temperature, they help improve air quality, they're able to act as a windbreak, they intercept rainwater and absorb stormwater. They protect us from UV rays and they protect habitat for biodiversity. Now, if we're considering planting trees, we should always, uh, to ensure the maximized climate actions are taken from them, we should consider planting native plant species, 
all those growing, uh, all those that are able to grow in growing zones to the south of us as we are dealing with a warmer climate. We should aim to, to mix up the species to minimize the impacts of pests and diseases. We should consider drought and pollution tolerate species in urban areas, as we know more temperature equals poorer air quality. And we should plant shade trees on the west to maximize shading. The next sector in uh, today's topics is soils. Now soils are very complex and have a huge role in the climate change action scenario system. However, they are only good if they are in a healthy condition. And I think that's what the main message of today will need to be, is that healthy soils can help unlock a number of climate change actions. Now soils are generated as a result of plant material breaking down into the soil or from secretion of agricultural livestock animals. There is a number of microorganisms that break down that material and as a result they actually release greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. However, the material that is left behind is a carbon storage deposit. And the healthier the soil, the more carbon it is able to absorb. So we do have to consider sustainable soil management techniques in order to protect our ability to absorb carbon into our soil systems. So first and foremost, we need to conserve soil biodiversity. So making sure that the types of plant matter that is breaking down in a certain area is varied so that there is different nutrients being applied into that soil. We need to make sure we minimize uh, tillage so we're not churning it up too much and leaving those layers to generate on their own. We need to rotate our crops and diversify it so that we're not stripping any soils of any particular nutrients. We want to make sure that our soil is protected, uh, especially during the winter months when it may be bare by pro pro planting things like winter crops. And some examples of unsustainable soil management is um, heavy tilling, um, application, over application of chemicals, got to think about leaving it bare in the winter and allowing soil to erode, driving on it and compacting soil. These are all bad things for soils that can actually cause the soil to release more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere versus absorb. So climate messaging for soils, from a mitigation perspective, soils can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions by storing carbon, allowing plant matter to break down, adding compost to soil reduces waste methane, and soil allows trees and plants to grow which also store carbon. So that's how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from soil. But from an adaptation perspective, soils also have the ability to reduce flood risk by absorbing and slowing down precipitation, particularly in a healthy soil scenario. They also help improve water quality by filtering out impurities. They support biodiversity, so they allow plants and, and insects to grow, um, and they help ensure our food security, which could be at risk with the increasing changes to climate change. So climate actions for soils could include reducing erosion through the planting of tree or natural vegetation buffers, ensuring compaction is avoided, making sure crops are rotated to support soil fertility, reducing pesticide application, operating a no-till method, or adding compost from the waste sector. My final sector today is agriculture and climate change. So as you can imagine, the forestry, the soil, and the agriculture sector are very much inter intertwined as it relates to climate change action. Similar to the forestry sector, agriculture plants, so our crop farming, has the ability to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in their biomass. However, livestock agriculture, it does the opposite. Livestock um, consumes plant materials and as a result gives off methane and other nitrous gases into the atmosphere, which are both greenhouse gas emissions. That being said, those emissions are also critical for maintaining soil uh, health, which also has a soil um, a carbon storage ability. So it is a cycle and, and livestock animals do play a large role in securing um, the carbon cycle within our agricultural sector. 
Something else to consider when we're dealing with the agriculture sector is wet crops such as rice also emit methane. So it's not just the plant sector that has the ability to uh, absorb emissions, it also has the ability to emit greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So from an agriculture perspective, agriculture generates and absorbs greenhouse gas emissions. Livestock emit methane, plants store carbon, deforestation emits carbon, soil emits and absorbs greenhouse gas emissions. Forest fires or crop fires also emit greenhouse gas emissions. From an adaptation perspective, growing seasons are likely to change. And as a result, we're likely to be impacted by more pests and diseases. There will be negative impacts to pollinators. We are concerned about water scarcity and water quality, but we do need to support biodiversity, allow for our plants to grow and ensure food security. So when it comes to climate actions for agriculture, we should consider all of the soil climate actions as previously discussed, looking at smaller scale farming that allows for the rotation of crops and pasture, apply an integrated pest management system versus go straight to chemicals for fertilizer and, and herbicides. So looking at ways in which we can integrate native plants to rotate crops, um, how we can plant um, certain plants next to each other to mitigate other insects, finding ways to switch crop varieties that are heat or drought tolerant, planting native pollinator plants as buffers to encourage natural pollination of species, and also encourage the consumption of local and in-season food, maybe through farmers markets or uh, community supported agriculture programs, finding ways to reduce meat consumption and making sure that we're using all of the meat that is being made available to us to reduce waste, and reducing water consumption using things like drip irrigation or rain water harvesting through our, our agricultural applications. So climate change is fairly complex and it impacts our society in a number of different ways. But I think there really are four main pillars that we need to consider. There is the rising temperatures, the extreme weather, our air quality impacts and the vector borne diseases. That's how it impacts us from a society. And when we consider the, the, the different sectors, whether it be forestry, whether it be soils or agriculture, they all have an ability to affect our economy as well as our environment. I mean, as a result, our mental well-being and our health is compromised as a result of the degradation of those sectors. So making sure that climate action is, in, is integrated into any day-to-day um, -day sector will help ensure that our society can deal with climate change in a better way. When we also take climate change action, there is a significant benefit to health. Reducing climate change impacts has indirect benefits. For example, fewer deaths and injuries from extreme weather events if we protect our products better, if we protect our uh, buildings better, um, if we make sure that our communities are well shaded from trees and we reduce heat island effect, we are reducing the risk of things like skin cancer from UV radiation. Um, and by making sure that we are um, properly maintaining our, our stormwater, rainwater, and water systems, we are reducing the spread of vector-borne diseases across our communities. Other interventions include producing more renewable energy, which is cleaner. We're able to improve the insulations of our home, which makes them healthier. We are encouraging the uh, use of lower emission vehicles, meaning that it's, it's healthier for us to be outside. The fact that we're promoting active transportation and getting people moving um, has a significant health benefit. We are promoting the, the consumption of local and healthier food products by consuming local um, and overall helping to move towards a much cleaner and more active lifestyle. So climate change action doesn't just help the environment, it helps our health as well. And from an economic perspective, we have a huge opportunity here in Canada to deal with climate change and actually maximize the economic values as a result of it. 
So for example, our energy sector, which is one of our biggest sectors um, global, that we provide globally, by switching towards cleaner, more renewable fuels, not only are we decreasing the cost of energy consumption for the individual homeowner, we're making it cheaper for people to do businesses and run their, um, and, and run their businesses and, and hire more people. The way that we deal with our forestry by making sure that there is more wood products available and sustainably managing our forests helps grow the sector that currently employs a number of people across the country. By reducing energy consumption within our housing and making it more resilient, we re we're increasing affordability, but we're also helping to grow the skilled trades and needed to build green, clean homes. By promoting local food, we're encouraging growth in our agricultural sector in a healthy and sustainable manner. By protecting our houses from flooding and severe weather events, we're reducing our insurance risk, which can save us home, uh, substantial amounts of money. Uh, we're making, cheaper, making it cheaper for people to, be biz to do business because if supplies are readily available at all times, regardless of a severe weather event, business can continue. And as a result, we can become more profitable as a country. So the economic benefits of climate actions are, there are more jobs in a low carbon sector, particularly in renewable energy and electric transportation. There are fuel and energy cost savings from being more efficient. There is uh, the ability to build better energy security. We will have better food security. So getting our food locally means that it doesn't matter what's happening around the world, we will we'll be able to feed ourselves. We're able to protect our infrastructure, which saves us money because it will last longer. We will save, uh, have savings as a result of insurance because we will not need to claim on it as often if we protect our infrastructure. And there are significant savings from our reduced health costs. So as I start to wrap up this presentation, um, it is important when you're dealing with climate change action that this cannot be championed by one body or one government agency, that the stakeholders in climate action include the federal government, the provincial government, the local government, conservation authorities who are critical for our managing our flooding, farmers, builders, the academics, our local environmental organizations and energy providers. And overall, if we really do want to take true climate change action, we need to consider renewable energy, low carbon homes, sustainable forestry, sustainable agriculture, active transportation, followed by clean fuel transportation, followed by clean tr local transit, and low carbon businesses and industries. So with that, I want to thank you all. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Jay. That was a fantastic presentation. And thank you to everyone else for all the amazing questions. So we do have quite a bit of questions. Uh, I apologize in advance if I don't get to all of them. I will try to address all of them, but we may not have enough time. Um, so the first question for Jade is, what degree of financial responsibility do residents have when it comes to recovery after an unexpected event? That's a really good question. And it really does depend on the climate event or the event that you're dealing with. For example, if you have flooding in your basement, um, it depends on your insurance coverage, but essentially it's 100% up to you, um, unless it can be proven to be negligence of some other party. Um, so yeah, I, that, I think that's one of the risks is if you're, you're personally receiving damage, the likelihood is it's the costs are on you. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is more effective, municipality green bins or backyard composting? That's a great question too, and it, it again, it depends. Um, it, first of all, it depends on whether you are actually going to use your composter or whether it's just going to be kind of a yard waste storage bin. Like, are you actively going to be creating that compost and then applying it to your land? And if that's the case, then I would 100% say, please deal with it yourself. Um, for many though, um, and we've got to think about people that live in apartment buildings or don't have large backyards, the green bin process for um, homeowners is much better at the curbside collection. Um, and then the good news is for that is um, because we create compost in such large bulk, 
we can actually provide it to our agriculture sector who need it to help with our with growing food so it kind of again it depends on on your personal situation as to what the best impact is okay next question is how do you recycle old electronics and where is this service available that's a very specific question so uh, again it depends on I'm not sure what municipality you are with um, I know here in Whitby for example you can take electronic waste to your um, local transfer station and they can collect it for free um, and then we deal with it. Um, you can also go to a number of private agencies as well. I mean, if you're looking at things like cell phones or smaller items, um, places like Staples and Best Buy often take your electronic waste for free as well. But uh, if you're trying to find a specific location, I recommend um, either looking up your local municipality or going to orangedrop.ca. That's orange, the color, drop.ca. Orange drop. Okay, thank you. Next question. Does Whitby offer any information or seminars to, rep to residents with respect to how to make your home more energy efficient? We are currently working on something very similar for the end of 2020. I've, uh, I'm fairly new to the town, so we're hoping to deliver a whole suite of programs in the upcoming year. Awesome. Okay, next question. Um, are electric cars really a better alternative given the materials that are used to make the car battery? Absolutely. I, I get this question a lot. So um, I work uh, very closely in the GTA um, electric vehicle strategy. Um, my background is in life cycle assessment. And there was a couple of programs that were released a few years ago that showed that an electric vehicle produces more um, emissions than a gasoline vehicle on the line. However, there was a major flaw in that study in the sense that they didn't consider the gasoline that is used to power those gasoline vehicles, whereas an electric vehicle, um, essentially, especially here in Ontario, it's greenhouse gas free. Um, so overall, they are absolutely um, far, far greener from a greenhouse gas emission perspective. We are also now seeing that their lifespan is significantly longer. And I also want to emphasize that at the end of a lifespan, uh, with something like a battery, that product is so valuable in resources, it's never going to just get thrown in a landfill. Those products are able to be taken out of a car and recycled and reused for something else. Thank you. Two more questions. Uh, how are municipalities creating awareness about inadequate percentage of recycling after curve pickup? Yeah, so we, we are um, huge advocates of a better recycling system for Ontario. Um, at this time, how the waste gets managed is governed by the province, and the province is currently updating its legislation to deal with that. Um, we strive to ensure that any of our buyers of waste products go to um, socially responsible um, companies. Nothing really now leaves the country, so everything gets dealt with within Canada. Um, so there's a lot of changes coming to our system in a very short amount of time. So stay tuned on that one. Okay, so this is uh, the last question. I think this is a really good question for the students who are listening. Do you have any suggestions on getting involved in this area of environmental study and science as a student? So I think um, what they mean is any programs or co-op opportunities that you might know of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, first of all, participating in things like the Envirothon um, or volunteering with groups like Ontario Nature, your local conservation authority are really great ways to get exposed to your community and get exposed to the township. There's also a number of uh, one-off programs like Youth Challenge International are running a climate change program right now. I know in Whitby, we have a fantastic group called Fridays for Future Whitby who are part of the, the climate protest group as well. So I think it's getting involved in the local community as much as possible and find, find the uh, organization or the uh, campaign that, that you really care about. Okay, thank you. So I actually have one last question for you. I lied. Um, a couple of people were wondering if you would mind uh, sharing your slides or sharing your presentation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this can be made publicly available. And if okay. anyone has any questions, feel free to shoot me an email afterwards as well. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jane. So I think that wraps up our Q&A session as well as our webinar session. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you everybody for all the amazing questions. Um, and I apologize if I couldn't get to all of the questions, but um, Jay, as Jay mentioned, you can always email her and she'll be more than happy to answer any more questions that you might have. Uh, so once again, thank you everyone and have an amazing day.